Chair, we are still too shy of quorum. We'll just give it another minute if you don't mind. Yeah, let's give them a couple more minutes. And then uh, if we um, don't get quorum, we can go through the um, some of the uh, action items, number four, five, and six, and then we can circle back and if we get quorum during that time. We can approve the minutes and, and move forward. Hi, Director Service, nice to see you. Thanks for being here. We still getting used to the title? Yes. <laughs> Well, Chair, we are still too shy of quorum, so I will leave it at your discretion on how you'd like to proceed. We are sending a reminder email to the committee to ask them to join. But Thank we do you. have all of our speakers here. Great. Well, why don't we just move forward to item number four? And um, yeah, I'm kind of eager to learn more about this affordable housing policy and maybe some of the legislation that's going to be moving through, possible as legislation. <clears throat> so why don't we get started with item number four? Uh, so, as we all know, there's a variety of factors that are influencing the uh, uh, the, the housing crisis from uh, supply chain to labor forces, everything else uh, that's going on. So we've got uh, a nice report here from Joan Service, the executive director of the Arizona Department of Housing, and she will present on the legislative and policy steps to reduce barriers to affordable housing and ending the homelessness in Phoenix and Arizona. Joan, if you're ready, please take it away. I'm ready, thank you for having me. Just one point of clarification and one question. A uh, point of clarification is that um, I'm currently the executive director of the, am I in, am, am I having audio issues? issues? Can you guys hear no. me okay? No. We can. There's a little bit of an echo, Joan. Do you have, are you playing this through more than one thing at your desk? No. Okay. If everybody else could mute their lines, that will probably help with the quality of audio. Okay. Assuming everything's okay. So uh, currently the executive director of the Arizona Housing Coalition, uh, a statewide advocacy organization working to end homelessness by advocating for safe, affordable homes for all Arizonans but effective January 30th, then I will become the director. I was appointed by Governor uh, Katie Hobbs to be the director of the Arizona Department of Housing. So big role, big responsibilities, but I'm up for the challenge as long as you guys all come with me. Congratulations. I think she mentioned that at the uh, breakfast yesterday. Yes, she, okay. She was yes. apologizing for sealing you, but uh, <laughs> it's a great choice by Governor Hobbs. So thank you for being here. I think so too, but I'm a little yeah. biased. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the, the the quick question is, um, is it okay if I ask someone to run the slides? I think Mimi, would you be okay with that? Just say next slide and our, um, our IT person, Tyler, will be happy to advance them for you. Okay, fantastic. So on the screen, obviously you see um, uh, information about uh, the Arizona Housing Coalition, typical uh, professional trade association that you'd imagine like the multi-family uh, housing association, et cetera, but that's our mission. We, very similar to all the trade associations, we have three pillars, um, education, advocacy, and coordination, because we know that we have to address this on that, address um, our housing crisis on um, multi-levels and we need to have highly trained workforce, the policy solutions and the coordination to get this job done. If you can go to the next slide. 
So before I begin, I find it helpful when we talk about the needs, demands, and policy solutions to set the stage a little bit by saying, um, when we talk about uh, the need in affordable housing, we need to talk about those who are most in need, um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So to solve homelessness, it definitely requires an understanding of the very num the number of factors that contribute to this complex problem, poverty, domestic violence, mental health issues, substance abuse, systemic inequities that exist in both the labor and the housing markets are all commonly uh, uh, common, common factors that contribute to this issue. But the primary reason that people become and remain homeless is the lack of affordable housing. Affordable housing is scarce in our state and across the nation. The need far exceeds the, the supply, especially for those individuals and families with extremely low incomes. This map that you see before you was created by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and it reveals, it may, you may not be able to zoom in high enough, but uh, it reveals that the Arizona's renter housing supply can only meet a quarter of the state's needs. The state is, sh is short roughly 170,000 housing units, according to the Department of Housing. Phoenix area eviction rates continue to climb just at the same level as rent hikes. And the valley has high inflation rates in the country, the highest inflation rates in the country, housing even less affordable. Only two other states, Nevada and Canada, or I'm sorry, Nevada and California have a greater shortage. And here's the reality is we never really recover from the last Great Recession. We, you know, it's often thought Arizona has plenty, uh, plenty uh, of housing supply, but the reality is, is that from the last um, Great Recession, that we had budget shortfalls slashes to rental assistance, eviction and homeless prevention programs shut down, and then other programs built year year long waits. And so um, it is no longer the case that we have this plethora of affordable housing. This is not an Arizona problem. This is not an America problem. This is not an Arizona problem. This is a nationwide problem. Um, and it's something that we are going to need that all hands on deck approach. If you can go to the next slide. Wages are not keeping up. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a full-time worker in Arizona must earn $22.30, which is different than um, the, as you see on the, uh, on the map, a $21.25. That's the national um, average for a, a, a housing wage for a one bedroom. But in Arizona, costs are a little bit more. So an average full-time worker must earn $22 dollars and 30 cents which is the hourly wage needed to afford a modest rental home without spending more than 30 percent of his or her income on housing costs um, all of this is to say that housing costs are out of reach for the average renter and for families uh, for especially families that are made up of low-wage workers seniors and people with disease in arizona more one and a half full-time jobs or 60 hours per week to afford a modest one bedroom apartment. And if that minimum wage worker is a single parent, they have to work 72 hours per, per week to afford a two bedroom rental home. And they're gonna be further pressed to put food on the table, find safe childcare and, and access preventative healthcare. As you see on the map, uh, I'm sorry, on, the, on the, the chart before you, 11 of the 25 largest occupations in the United States pay a lower hourly wage than a wage a full-time worker needs to earn a modest one or two bedroom apartment. These workers, the workers in this, these occupations account for over 35% of the total U.S. workforce, excluding farm workers. Again, the hourly wage listed in yellow is listed is the national data but Arizona's housing wage is $22.30. So let's talk about solutions. Can you go to the next slide? At the national level, we, the Arizona Housing Coalition follows the federal budgeting process to make sure that federal agencies like HUD and SAMHSA and HHS receive the highest level of funding for affordable housing, homelessness, and community development. Unfortunately, the chaos in our new Congress foreshadows a tumultuous budget process. And while advocates and congressional champions in the, pre in the previous Congress were able to successfully 
secure a meaningful increase in HUD programs in the fiscal year 22 budget, significantly more resources are needed, including a very real missed opportunity in strengthening our one of the largest uh, programs, affordable housing programs um, in our country, which is the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. There was a missed opportunity at the in the end of the year tax tax extender negotiations where they missed that opportunity to really strengthen the affordable um, Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. So we're going to continue to work with our congressional members to to champion that issue. You can go to the next slide. Since there is such inaction at the federal level, we can try and affect change at the state and local level. So as many of you are aware, following the end of the last legislative session, an interim legislative housing supply study committee um, of created of 11 members uh, was, was, was created. Uh, the committee met a dozen times and we traveled all over the state. I happened to be on it as well as um, two other, uh, Mayor Corey Woods from the city of Tempe and Jean Moreno, from the city of Glendale and then several legislators um, and other uh, uh, housing stakeholders. So we uh, traveled all over the state, met a dozen times. Um, we heard some testimony from housing stakeholders, elected officials indiv and individuals and in industry impacted, impacted by our state's housing shortfalls. The output of uh, that study committee was an economic analysis the chairman's recommendations, I'm sorry, the co-chair's recommendations, as well as um, other recommendations. And ultimately the outcome of that will be legislation introduced at uh, this legislative session. Of note, um, I wanted to share with you um, six, uh, the six recommendations made by co-chair Kaiser, because that does impact um, folks, on the, it, folks on the call, folks in the field, um, especially housing advocates and uh, our local jurisdictions. Um, uh, the six recommendations, uh, co-chair uh, Kaiser found that there is no clearinghouse for data and reporting related to housing supply. Um, and while MAG does it, obviously, and this is me editorializing, sorry, MAG does a phenomenal job in providing data. Um, co-chair Kaiser felt that there wasn't enough um, understanding of what is on the, in the pipeline. And so um, he recommends that ADOH and the Arizona Commerce Authority create an interactive housing needs assessment dashboard to provide data and transparency on housing supply. And he also recommends a reconvening of the State Interagency Council on Housing and Homelessness. More on that in a minute. So we'll leave that pin there just for one second. The second finding is that zoning is the primary barrier to addressing the housing shortage and um, co-chair uh, Kaiser recommends regulatory relief for zoning by reform by reforming zoning laws that's um, he feels that, that uh, there can be an adequate way to uh, still provide community input and also address the missing middle through accessory dwelling units, reducing lot sizes, coverage, setback, and parking minimums. Co-chair Kaiser uh, uh, found that homes in Arizona take too long to be built and recommends allowing at-risk approval permits at the munici municipal level to allow building to continue while still holding developers accountable and creating a consistency in the public comment timeframes. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll editorialize at the end of this. Um, uh, the fourth finding is that starter homes, both for sale and for rent, have been regulated out of Arizona, er, out of Arizona, and recommends limiting the discretionary review of design standards, including unnecessary costs, ambiguity, and time. Um, uh, he also, or co-chair Kaiser, uh, found that our most vulnerable are running out of housing options and recommends allowing for single room occupancy housing typology, setting aside shelter and public money to protect our most vulnerable, and creating a permanent funding source for the housing trust fund. Again, more on that in one minute. And then the final finding that he shared is that NIMBYism, so again, not in my backyard, has had a dramatic impact on our housing supply and recommends creating appeals processes for building that meet city zoning and city codes, um, but yet uh, for developers that, that still get denied by council. So obviously what this uh, alludes to is the fact that um, we heard a lot of testimony that there is some healthy tensions between the developer 
community and local jurisdictions. Um, again, me editorializing, I would say that I think all of those can be, um, uh, the, some of those barriers and, and tensions can be removed by strong communication and local jurisdictions having some an opportunity to hear the complaints and find that appropriate balance for each, each jurisdiction. Co-Chair Kaiser committed to continuing the stakeholder conversations, but I will share that at the same time that that committee was wrapping up, the timing aligned really well so that Governor Hobbs was obviously taking office and immediately um, implementing her Arizona is home housing plan, which was um, originally unveiled in her campaign website, but she hit the ground running by reinstating the interagency and community council on housing and homelessness. Again, that's co-chair Kaiser's first recommendation, as well as investing um, as well. The governor Hobbs um, is investing $150 million into the state housing trust fund in her budget, which can be revealed uh, for sure on Friday and obviously hinted at in her state of the state um, address. And I will also uh, share that on her second day in office, um, the governor and I were volunteering with the Arizona Service Project on home repairs in the um, Avondale area. So really, she really is building an Arizona for everyone. With the governor's um, commitment towards addressing housing and homelessness, I, I will share that it makes my current job at the Arizona Housing Coalition um, our policy lift a lot easier. Um, it, that's what really what we were, I wanted to share with you what we were aligning our legislative agenda to be. First, it was going to be or is going to be securing a $200 million investment into the Housing Trust Fund, as well as um, identifying an ongoing sustainable funding source. So with the governor's um, action, we only had to bridge a 50 million gap, but really the hard part is again going to be finding that ongoing sustainable funding source. The second is to increase the Department of Economic Security's allocation for the coordinated homeless program line item through either direct state general fund dollars or an increase of lottery funds. So, so that coordinated homeless line item that DES oversees, it's made up of a million dollars from lottery general funds and some federal TANF dollars. Um, now, those dollars usually go to support the ongoing um, operational costs of nonprofits um, the, the, the nonprofit work of engaging our unhoused Arizonans and connecting them to housing and shelter options. Our third uh, legislative priority is that currently Arizona statute uh, allows rural school districts to create housing options, otherwise known as teacherages, for their staff. We want to expand this option for both urban and suburban areas to fill the needed gap in uh, workforce housing for Arizona educators. Our fourth, fourth legislative priority is to reconvene the State Interagency Council on Housing and Homelessness. Check. <laughs> um, five is to uh, encourage zoning changes to fa that facilitates more affordable housing development. Again, um, very similar to the governor's plan um, in, included in her Arizona's home um, policy objectives. We want to make sure that um, local jurisdictions really can can be a part of the conversation about incentivizing and using incentivizing incentivizing developers and um, tapping into state resources to really encourage affordable housing development. And then lastly, this is more of an um, education this year, and then we'll we'll really hit the ground running next year. Is that we want to continue to elevate the efficacy of the state low income housing tax credit program, which we were successful in adopting a couple of years ago, but it is set to be um, discontinued. Um, the, the credit ends in 2025, but we really want to um, highlight the, the efficacy of it. We need it to be uh, continued and strengthened. And again, it's um, it's it's a vital resource that we we need to definitely educate our lawmakers because there's a ton of I'm, I'm actually at this Arizona State Senate right now in one of their caucus rooms. There's a lot of new faces, and so we need to educate them on um, housing policy. So I'm gonna oh sorry, last slide if you don't mind. That's my contact information for now, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I know some of the conversations around the housing trust fund or what have you, it's really in the weeds, but I'm happy to, uh, to clarify or answer any questions. Thank you for that, for that presentation and, and uh, the deep dive. I think uh, for some of us online here, 
Um, I'll kind of get the question started. Can you explain a little bit more about, is it LIHTC, how that works from uh, mm -hmm. the tax abatement? Uh, does the money go to the renter or does it go to, how does it, how does that work? Sure, sure. And you know what, I'm going to put one of my colleagues on the spot and um, see my my dear <clears throat> friend, uh, Sally Schwinn, but it is it does not go to uh, the renters. It actually serves as a financial tool um, for the developers to build that affordable housing development, because obviously there's a lot of upfront costs and a lot of um, hard costs to try and make rent a lot more affordable so that once it is developed, we can continue to create that, um, again, that low rent. Sally, can you say it maybe a little bit more eloquently than I? <laughs> <laughs> sure. And actually, that's what part of my presentation is on. So why don't we oh. just table that a little bit and then I'll and then I'll answer the question as soon as we get to it. So that way we can we can finish up with all the great questions for Joan. Great segue, Mark, then. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for me? Do I see any hands up? Well, that is uh, means you had an extremely thorough presentation, and uh, and and everybody online here is 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 dialed in with you. So um, great presentation, <clears throat> and it's good that you that we're continuing to talk about these issues and with the population increase of, of Maricopa County, especially, and like you had said, you know, with housing um, builders, almost like. What do we have? Like uh, forty percent less builders than we had in two thousand and eight. So I mean, it's it's coming at you from all angles. So we're just grateful for the work that you're doing to to help house people and 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 fix this issue. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank um, you. Let's go ahead and move on. Uh, sure, if that's Stuart. okay with everybody. Sure, uh, Stuart, you do now have quorum. We have quorum. Great. Well, let's uh, let's circle back to item number one and let's take let's call this meeting to order and take some roll. And uh, to make a call to the audience, if you want to get us started, Kelly, that'd be great. Um, Chair Stewart, we do not have any comments, or um, and we have not had any any um, outside interest from the uh, from the public. So um, on this item or any other items on the agenda of today. All right, Stupa, you want to take the roll and and get this thing going, and we'll approve the minutes. I'd be happy to. Thank Bill you, Tana, City of Peoria. Rachel Sanders. <clears throat> Amy Yentes, excuse me, Monica, on behalf of Amy Yentes with the town of Gilbert. Wally Campbell. Ali Klein. Here. Thank you. Tina Condi. Here. Thank you. Monica Dorsey. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Jen Duff. Supervisor Steve Gallardo. Council member Benny Janik. Here. Thank you. Sarah Keen on behalf of Joel Navarro. Here. Thank you. And Chair Mark Stewart. I am here. Thank you. You have Great. cards. Well, we have no uh, comment cards from the public and, and I don't think there's anybody online that uh, is wanting to make a comment at this time. I'd love to take a motion to, if everybody's re reviewed the meetings from the minutes from last meeting, I'd love to take a motion to approve those. Motion to approve the minute. This is Councilor Condi, a second. Thank you. So we have a, um, a motion to approve and a second. Kelly, can you get those names for me? And uh, uh, if anybody is uh, dissenting, please uh, say so. Otherwise we will uh, affirm the motion uh, forward. Council member Ali Klein. Yes. Thank you. Council member Tina Condi. Aye. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Council member Betty Janik. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Keown on behalf of Joel Navarro. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Chair Mark Stewart. Yes. Thank you. Well, great. Motion so passes. we're going to go skip over item number four and move over to item number five. Uh, it's a presentation from Gorman and Company, who has recently done, uh, is helping us in Chandler with some, uh, some housing uh, product as well. So since 1984, Gorman and company have specialized in downtown revitalization, the preservation of affordable housing, workforce housing, and the adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Sally, who we just met a little bit ago, uh, the Arizona market president, will present on the difference between workforce and affordable housing, and I guess LIHTC as well, and how the Gorman and company has developed properties across the region. Sally, thanks so much for being here and uh, sharing 
uh, this story with our group. Uh, you can take it away at any time. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And You're very everybody. welcome. And I do want to take the opportunity to congratulate Joan Service for her new role. We are um, thrilled about that. I think Governor Hobbs made an incredible choice. So I think it's She's definitely, Joan, you're going to do a fantastic job. So we're excited. Anyway, all right, I'll start my uh, discussion here about uh, basically the difference between affordable and workforce housing. And as Joan brought up, what low income housing tax credits, and Mark, you asked some questions, those are generally um, kind of put in the bucket for what's called affordable housing. So um, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and, give you a little overview on Gorman and then uh, kind of jump right into a kind of a 30,000 foot explanation because as you can imagine, there's some some uh, deep details in, in how tax credits work. Um, so you can move to the next slide, please. So Gorman and Company is, um, we like to consider ourselves as a mission-driven for-profit developer. We really focus on community revitalization. Um, we primarily partner with uh, municipalities and nonprofits and other stakeholders in putting together uh, projects that, that enhance the, the community and, and what's needed. Um, certainly, as, as Joan was going through her presentation and, and the need for housing, um, it's, it's something that is doing nothing but growing. Um, so uh, we, uh, we've been uh, developing affordable housing for 38 years, since uh, 1987, when the um, tax credit uh, code changed, Section 42 allows low-income housing tax credits. So um, Gary Gorman, who established our company, actually um, based in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, we've grown the firm to over 540 team members. Our company is what we call vertically integrated. So not only do we do the development, but we also do the, the general construction. We do the architecture and design. We do all the property management and asset management. And, uh, and we do a lot of compliance work. So that's a, another big part of how these properties are, are governed. Um, we are consistently in the top 15 developer list um, with the affordable housing finance for doing affordable housing projects. And we've grown, we're, um, we, we were established in Arizona in 2007, right in the, in the downturn. <laughs> but since that time, um, and that was the first market we grew out of Wisconsin, but now we're in Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Florida, and the list goes on, as you can see. Um, and, and really we focus on, as we're talking today, on, on low-income housing tax credits or affordable housing and workforce. And we are also, um, have a, a very strong background in historic renovation projects. You can switch slides. So kind of digging into the low income housing tax credit uh, program. It's the largest affordable program in, in the country. It's really, um, since, since 1987, it really sparked this opportunity to finance projects using tax credits for equity. Um, basically, the... Um, the, the Section 42, as I mentioned earlier, is controlled by the IRS and governed there, but it's administered through the Arizona Department of Housing. So um, every state receives a certain amount of what we call of a tax credit allocation, which is based upon the, um, the per capita and the, and the census. So that's getting way into the weeds, but every, every state gets a, a certain amount that they can distribute out to, um, to affordable housing developers. There's two different programs for low-income housing tax credits that are on the federal level. One is what's called a 9% uh, program, which is a competitive program, which we, um, there's, there's criteria that is dictated from the Arizona Department of Housing through a qualified allocation plan. So once a year, there's a, a due date for our applications for this 9% uh, credit. And typically just, uh, to make it simple, a 9% credit allocation provides about 70% of the equity needed to build an affordable housing project. There's another program called a 4% low-income housing tax credit program that couples with tax-exempt bonds. In those projects, it's non-competitive um, and it, it includes um, tax-exempt bonds that are issued through the Arizona, or in this case, Arizona Finance Authority and we receive about 30% of the equity from that program. 
So um, with regard to the, the 9% program, uh, typically that's strictly for um, afford it's the affordable housing and it's based on rents and incomes in the 60, well, under 80% uh, AMI level, which is area median income. Um, it's typically known as being under 60%, but recently there's a, a new um, uh, procedure, I guess you could call it, uh, where we're allowed to do some income averaging. So we can go up to 80%, but the entire project has to be uh, at least a 60% or less of area median income for it to be an, a, a LIHTC project. So I know it gets, again, it's, it's hard to explain it just from the top that's that's in general terms how how that works, and you can move to the next slide. So, as an example of some of Gorman's projects, um, to date we've built twenty one projects since that two thousand seven date when we started in the market, which is about sixteen hundred units. We have six projects under construction currently, which is almost seven hundred units, and we actually have eleven projects in pre development, which is over eighteen hundred units. So. We're, um, we're located throughout the state. Um, we have a, a, a strong relationship and have a number of projects in Phoenix, Mesa, Glendale, Chandler, as, as Mark mentioned, we're working with the city there on, an, on a new project. City of Tucson, Avondale, Surprise, Tempe, Nogales, Yuma, Prescott, and, and Globe currently. So I can go into a couple of those projects as examples um, and talking to a couple, a couple other cities currently as well. Um, so you can see some of the photos here. Um, we th These projects are all very, very different. Um, you see at the top of the page, the Fort Whipple project is a, a partnership with US Vets, which is a nonprofit that's, that provides uh, supportive services to, to the veterans. Um, we're working with the Prescott US Vets branch. And then we were both procured as a partnership by the, the VA to redevelop these, these quarters buildings that were built in 1908. And then they've got a um, parcel of land, about three acres that will be developing 80 acre or 80 units of, um, of housing for the chronically homeless veterans on that project. Um, Choice Neighborhoods Phoenix is a project where we are the development partner with the, with the city of Phoenix. We are in the process of redeveloping um, what was approximately 577 units that surrounded the old St. Luke's Hospital around 16th and 18th Street in Van Buren. We currently um, are going to break ground on the first phase, the first project of the third phase in, uh, in May. So we have completed the first 177 units in phase one. Uh, we are opening the next 120 units next month, um, and then we'll be completing uh, the next 115 units. And those those four projects make up the first two phases. So altogether, we'll be developing 1,100 units um, of, of mixed use housing. So we will be having affordable and market rate units. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then you can see a, a photo of the of Mesa Heights. That's in the city of Yuma. Um, where we partnered with actually both the Housing Authority in Yuma and the city of Yuma provided the, the land. And Hill Street School and Globe, we're very excited about. That's a historic renovation of the old Hill Street School, a um, hundred year old building where we will be renovating that building and adding on another building um, to create 64 units of senior housing. Um, oh, and I see at the bottom of the page, Tucson House is a 407 unit 14 um, tower building, public housing. We're partnering with city of Tucson on um, the redevelopment and uh, rehab of this building as well. So I'll let you switch, switch slides from here. So um, the, the properties I just mentioned are all financed with LIHTC. So those were all 4% and 9% financing structures. Um, another, uh, before, uh, I guess, creative uh, way of financing is, is worth workforce housing. It's a little bit more challenging because we don't have the benefit of using the, the low income housing tax credits to uh, attract that additional equity from, from big institutions that buy tax credits. Um, the workforce housing is typically focused on 
the 80 percent um and and i know it says up to free market rents but really it's up to about 120 percent of the ami levels so so this housing really helps provide what what's called commonly the missing middle so the teachers and the services the nurses um police fire those those folks that really you know keep our communities running that they, they end up in the missing middle where they're they don't qualify for the affordable housing that's 60 percent or less of ami but they are priced out of the the uh very high market rate um housing uh as well so so it's really a focus on on that missing middle um it, it's really the programs there to to create the um, below market rents to ensure some su sub some stable housing for these folks, and um, it gets a little more challenging because it's it needs to be financed with typical debt and equity programs. So there are um, our programs throughout this the country. For instance, with Colorado, their housing agency, which is called the you know California or Colorado Housing Authority. They actually um, provide a program to uh, supplement workforce housing projects. So I'll, I'll go to the next slide and, and give you guys an example of, of oh, it'll be a two, two slides from here. Let me go through this real quick. Um, the, this just gives you a continuum of how the housing works. Um, the, at the bottom of the page, you see the low income housing tax credit typically um, focuses on the 60% or less of area median income. As I mentioned before, it, we can increase that to 80%, but everything has to blend to 60% or less now. Workforce housing is typically that 80% to 120% AMI, and then the market rate housing is uh, is higher than 120%. All right, now we can go to the, our example on the next page. This is, uh, I should be looking at my other uh, slideshow. Uh, this is the example, once again, of our Choice Neighborhoods project. This is, this is, uh, the, the project I mentioned a little bit earlier, you see uh, St. Luke's Hospital in the middle of the page. The project to the to the right of the screen by the park is complete, and then the uh, the balance of the the project on the forefront is under construction. And then the in the back, that project will begin probably next year. You can go ahead and change. And here's another picture of the saloon. And this is a project that's completed. Uh, with the choice neighborhoods, so you can. And actually, I will. I will add since Jones on that we uh, we re received our uh, project of the of the year for this project last year from Arizona Department of Housing. So we're very very excited about this one. Um, so this this is a a very great example. Uh, uh, let me add one other e detail. The City of Phoenix applied for what's called a Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant and was awarded $30 million for this redevelopment from HUD. So that $30 million is actually, actually being capitalized into about $120 million of capital investment into this entire redevelopment. So it's, it's, a, it's a great um, example of how the, the governments can work together, how these programs work together to, to create this housing. All right, we can move to the next one. Here's the, the workforce housing example I was waiting for. So this is a project in, in Colorado. This project is um, a combination of workforce and low-income housing tax credits. Um, in this case, it's uh, the, the land is in um, uh, Keystone. And there's the Vail Resorts is a group that, you know, obviously they run all sorts of ski resorts, not just in Vail. But there's always a very big need to bring housing into these communities because certainly the cost of housing is much higher than what the folks that provide the services can afford. So in this case, uh, Kimball Krangle, who is in my role in Colorado, worked with, with uh, Keystone and so forth with Summit County to um, have this land contributed through through Vail Resorts to a project on a long-term ground lease. And they were able to self-impose a, um, a land use restriction allowing for um, a certain number of units to be 
set aside through a long-term lease with uh, Vail Resorts for folks that uh, that had to work within the community uh, a minimum of, of 12 months. So this is this is kind of a, a putting together our own type of low-income housing tax credit uh, program, if you will, because these projects are set aside through a, a land use agreement um, for folks that earn um, a blended of 100% AMI. So it serves the community and the folks that cannot afford to, to live there otherwise. Um, and then there's also the blend with the low income housing tax credits project phase where that would be focused on the 60% or less of AMI. So this gives you an example of getting creative. Um, the Chaffa did provide funding for this project as well. So there's always a very elaborate uh, capital stack to get these deals done. Uh, but we are looking to expand this program and actually working on a couple projects in Arizona uh, under the same pretense with partners. So um, it's it's something that's needed and something that um, I think is becoming and will become uh, greater popularity with housing agencies and with uh, investors as well. And then the next slide. So again, um, just a little bit of a summary for Wintergreen, which I just talked about. A total of 156 units are deed restricted for workforce, 40 units for 60% or less, less AMI with LIHTC. It was a, a big partnership, public, private, and nonprofit all together. Vail Resorts did the ground lease at Summit uh, County, provided the, um, the rezoning for the, the employee housing, which Zone talked to about the importance of, of zoning and all the policies to help encourage affordable housing and workforce housing, which is critical. Um, this was $58 million in total development costs for a very large project. Next slide. This is one last example I'll provide. This is a um, veterans project. We worked with the city of Tempe. Um, this was back when actually Mayor Woods was on city council and worked with um, with Gorman and Company uh, to provide the site this this project's lo like located on. This is through a uh, no cost lease. Um, we also partnered with uh, Arm Save the Family, which is a nonprofit who brings in the um, supportive services. This project is focused on housing female veterans and their and their children. So that is the preference. Um, as we know, there's a, a great need for veterans housing of all type. Typically, it's focused on 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 men. Um, in this case, the the priority is the female veterans and families, and they um, certainly we have we have all sorts there too. Um, so that's that's really the focus here with the supportive housing. We also received um, a grant from Diamondbacks Give Back to help with the the playground and the Thunderbirds charities provide the Head Start program space. So this is a great site um, located just a stone's throw from ASU on 8th, just to the east of rural. Um, actually, you can see the buildings behind it, or that's all the Greek village, the Greek village at ASU. And the next slide. And that, that sums it up. So I know that's a lot. I apologize if I went over my time, but hopefully I was able to give a, a high level explanation of, of how affordable LIHTC and uh, workforce can work together. That was extremely thorough. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I think we all have a, a better understanding of how the program works. So um, thank you for, for sharing that. Absolutely. Does anybody have any questions? Sally, I just wanna say, I'm so glad you're doing something with that interesting building in Globe. Cause I have driven past that building. I mean, there's so many cool buildings in that old town that are falling apart and it's great that you're gonna be able to preserve it. Thank you. We're so excited about that. So on a side mark, my mom is from Globe, so it's even more of a sentimental thing, <laughs> but it's it's really neat that we have this opportunity. So and, um, I wanted to say, I thought that your slide that showed the difference between affordable housing and low income housing was very, very instructive. <clears throat> that is a topic that many people don't quite understand. So thanks. That was great. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? I just had, I had a one question back on the, the, um, I think it, uh, the Colorado slide about, uh, so is the, is the, 
the, did you mention that you're, the, the housing is being built for the ski resort? So that so they have employees. So are are you saying that the the subsidies or the tax dollars is there to support the ski resort? Do they so pay? Do they pay anything, or is this just like do they not pay their people high enough to be able to live there, or how does that work? Well, that the, no, <laughs> but the the idea is uh, what what they've done is they've entered into a long term lease for uh, I think it's about twenty five percent of the units that can only be leased to their their employees. Um, and so, and, and, and I think that there's, there's a priority of their employees and then not certainly to other folks in the community, right? Because it's fair housing, but they, there's a long-term lease in place with Vail Resorts that they guarantee the rent at those levels. So, okay. so it enables us to rent the, the units for less than what the fair market rent is. And then Vail Resorts will cover the, the extra. So it's a self-subsidized program. Okay. All right. Yep. So it, it really encourage it enables them to bring people into town that can um, afford to, to live there and not drive okay. hours to work. So if you get the combination of them paying more and then the and then the uh, the light tech housing, then they have people that can work at their resort and then people that need to go ski can't. And and, and, it, and the and and the ski resort's a private company, right? Yeah. Okay. But, got it. but they operate in all all the ski towns, so it's, yeah. the, it's called Vale Resorts. But they operate. We're doing a project similar in Breckenridge, in Vale, and other other places as well. But got it. All right. Super. Yep. It's good stuff, Sally, and very thorough, especially that one slide. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. Um, any other questions from the from the floor? Fantastic. I'm just uh, I'll just add one more thing, Sally. And I don't know that Gorman has the ability to track this, but I would say I think there's there's longer term public health benefits to building worker housing, like the Colorado example, because if you think about the distance people were having to travel previously in the snow and in dangerous conditions to be able to get to work. And all of that being minimized, it's a ripple effect. You're not just improving the quality of life by providing them with ready housing, you're also improving their quality of life, I'm sure, for not having to motor motor accidents, all of that extra stuff too. Absolutely. And, and Kimball does have all those stats because this is, this is a program that we're trying to, you know, to grow within Colorado and then, like we said, in, in Arizona as well. So super. Good point, Kelly. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item number six. Uh, Presentation by Southwest Family Advocacy Center, uh, Southwest Family Advocacy Center. The Southwest Family Advocacy Center is a nonprofit that seeks to increase the coordination among professionals and reduce trauma for victims of child abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence, and elder abuse. Reem George, Victim Services Manager with the City of Avondale, will present on the activities and resources made available by the facility. Thank you, Reem, and uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, my name is Reem George. I'm the director of the Southwest Family Advocacy Center, and I just wanted to talk a little bit today about our services, who we are, what we do, um, and just some of our programming. Uh, so uh, we are located in Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, we are a multi-agency uh, advocacy center uh, comprised of Avondale Police Department, Buckeye Police Department, Goodyear Police Department, and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. So um, back in 2006, we created the Southwest Family Advocacy Centers through an intergovernmental agreement uh, where we have all cost sharing. So all the uh, operations and expenses of the program is shared among the four different law enforcement agencies. Um, I am an Avondale uh, Police Department employee, but I um, I am I do have four chiefs of police, right, who, are, who oversee me. There's a steering committee where we come once a month and I talk to the chiefs about uh, just kind of what's happening with the center and some of the programs and some of the uh, some of the events you know that are happening in the center and how the how things are going. Um, next slide, we could have that. Uh, thank you. 
So what is a family advocacy center? So we are actually a family advocacy center, but we're also a child family advocacy center. And the difference is the child family advocacy center serves uh, victims uh, under 18 and the family advocacy center serves adults. But we are actually uh, joined together in one advocacy center. Uh, so we are focused on providing, um, it's a multidisciplinary facility where we are dedicated to reducing the trauma of crime victims. Uh, here we do investigations, uh, we, we offer uh, medical um, SANE exams, sexual assault exams, uh, we have mental health counseling, we have a forensic interviewer that uh, interviews children and adults, um, we have um, lay legal advocates, we have a prevention coordinator, of course we have our detectives and sergeants, we have uh, four sergeants and there uh, and under them there are five detectives from each one of law enforcement agencies that um, that conduct the investigations um, for um, the different cases. So some of the cases that we see are um, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, we have domestic violence cases, adult sexual assault cases. Uh, we do see some elder abuse and human trafficking cases. Uh, of course, our mission is to ensure that uh, victims are treated with respect and dignity throughout the entire process, from the investigation all the way to the prosecution of the case. Um, we um, we do, I mean, we, we worked with a lot of different victims, uh, and just some of the statistics we have, uh, just last year we served about 2,000 individuals uh, with cases. Um, and we just keep climbing. So the previous, the 2021, we saw about 1,600 cases. And there are just a lot of different factors to that. Obviously, COVID increased those cases because, um, you know, uh, we had a lot of, we, we didn't have as many disclosures from the previous year. So we had a lot more disclosures last year. Um, 84% of our cases are child crime victims, um, mostly sexual uh, sexual abuse victims. Um, and uh, just, um, we do um, we do come together. I mean, really the, the, the reason there is an advocacy center is to come together to work on the cases. So this is the Office of uh, Child Welfare Investigation that is involved, the detectives, the victim advocates, the forensic interviewers. And really the point is to lessen the trauma for the crime victims. So they're not having to repeat their story over and over again to different agencies. And so we come together um, and we, we do a lot of case, uh, you know, case reviews and talk about it in our monthly uh, meeting, which is a multidisciplinary team meeting where we actually have the county attorney's office that come and, you know, they're expert in child cases and they come and provide a lot of feedback for our detectives with their investigations. Next slide. Uh, so this is what would, so this is what um, it would look like without an advocacy center. We have medical, we have mental health, we have legal, uh, we have different uh, services that victims would actually have to go all over the valley to, to get those services uh, done for them. But instead we have a center which provides all these services in house, including mental health services. So we do actually, um, uh, we provide up to nine months of mental health counseling through our VOCA funding, uh, where we have uh, trauma therapists that provide funding, uh, that provide uh, therapy for uh, children and their families. Um, and so um, it, it's just really nice in the sense that families come when there's a call out, the families come, they do their medical, they do their forensic interview, they do their investigation, talk to detectives. Um, and um, then they get referred to different resources. If it's resources in house, great. If it's resources that is needed outside, then we have a lot of partners and collaborators in the community that provides uh, these services for them. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are just some of our partners. We partner with a lot of different law enforcement agencies. And just because we are a four um, agency uh, advocacy center doesn't, doesn't mean that we don't provide services to all the other law enforcement agencies. For example, um, it, we may have um, a victim uh, that was victimized in the city of Mesa, but they live in Avondale or they live in Tolleson or El Mirage and it's very close to our center. So really we meet the victim where they're at and really the closest advocacy center is ours. So we would actually, uh, usually a detective would reach out to us and says uh, we would like to you know, uh, schedule a forensic interview and then we help them through that process. 
Um, so um, we, we do uh, partner with Honor Health for the adult medical exams and after our adult and child exams. And then Phoenix Children's Hospital that are going to start coming to all the advocacy centers to provide uh, child medical exams as well. And we have a lot of different partners. We also have an MOU with the FBI through the National Children's Alliance. Um, so we actually let them, lend them our space to conduct their own investigations as well. Uh, HSI is the same way. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we are, there are over, um, actually now there are over 900 child advocacy centers, um, and we are one of them. Uh, we are accredited through the National Children's Alliance, and we have to meet certain uh, national standards uh, to be accredited. Uh, as an accredited um, agency, uh, we are uh, kind of are allowed to apply for different funding and grant programs uh, to improve our programs and expand our center. Uh, we're actually up for uh, accreditation uh, coming up this year. Um, and so it's just a really nice way because we have um, a lot of partnerships. And then when we want to reach out to other advocacy centers in other states or cities, we're able to do that. And we facilitate that process of maybe uh, needing uh, maybe a victim who is, uh, lives in Arizona, but need, we need a forensic interview or we need some sort of service. Um, and so we have we kind of have that partnership with different states and cities. Uh, next. So uh, we are uh, part of the Arizona Child and Family Advocacy Network. Um, it includes 16 um, uh, child, child and family advocacy centers in the state of Arizona. And through them, we meet quarterly to talk about issues, to talk about cases, to talk about just kind of what's happening in the state of Arizona and apply for funding as well. Um, and then next slide, it just shows you where we are in, um, in, in Maricopa County, we're uh, about 20 miles east of Phoenix. So we're kind of out west. Uh, and so we serve that area and beyond. Uh, we uh, The Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, uh, they have county islands that they serve all the way to Gila Bend. So it's a pretty large area that we serve. And we're just growing. Uh, so with the growth, we're actually looking for uh, a space uh, in the next two years to move into because we're getting more detectives and more staff. And so we're just kind of growing in terms of programming, uh, but we are planning to stay in Goodyear just because it is a, um, it's a great uh, location for all the different agencies. So we are considered a one-stop shop. That's kind of what, the, what we're called, um, where we provide all these services for our crime victims. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, so this is kind of just uh, our, our lobby. It's, we've kind of improved it over time. Um, it doesn't look like a police station. It looks like uh, just your living, uh, living room. Um, dete our detectives don't wear their uniform. And when they're doing interviews with children, um, they don't actually wear their badge and gun. Uh, so we have forensic interviewers that conduct forensic interviews for children seven and under or for children or um, victims of chronic abuse. But otherwise, all of our detectives are trained in the Arizona uh, forensic interview training, advanced forensic interview training. So they are able to conduct forensic interviews as well. And when they do that, they don't wear their badge and guns. Uh, they don't usually wear their uniform unless they're out in the field conducting some operations or they're doing subpoenas or serving some sort of warrant. Um, it is an adult and child-friendly environment. We have rooms as well where families could stay. So just for privacy and confidentiality, where they talk to the detectives, they talk to the staff about, uh, about the case and their needs. Um, next. Okay, uh, so this is what... Uh, one of our, we have about, we have a, quite a few uh, family rooms. Uh, we have about four of them right now. And, you know, it's just a need to expand. We're actually, you know, looking into expanding our center and having more uh, family rooms as well, uh, where, you know, they come together with the, the detectives come together with the families to talk about the case, talk about the background, you know, how things happen, how they find out, things like that. They talk to the victim advocate uh, in this confidential setting. They talk to the forensic interviewers as well. Uh, and, and really those rooms are meant to be comfortable for the families. A lot of times they're spending quite a few hours here in our office, especially um, at the start of the investigation. Um, and so uh, if we hit next, I could show you, we have um, the uh, playroom. This is the playroom where um, uh, we have the children there while we're talking to the parents, the protective parents, the investigator and the protective parent, you know, confidentially. Conf we have a, 
the, the playroom where we have staff um, that oversee the children, just so it's, it's they're not um, discussing the case in front of the child or the victim. We're actually working on uh, making it a little bit more teenage friendly because a lot of the cases in the last two years, we've seen mostly teenagers, preteens between 12 and 17. So we're trying to uh, add more just uh, teenager friendly um, activities in that playroom. Um, let me see it. You know, usually, uh, it, you know, kids are usually very um, hesitant and reluctant to talk to somebody that they don't know, which is a forensic interviewer. So really, if the playroom is designed to make them feel a lot more comfortable and just to be able to interact with a safe um, a safe uh, staff member that is interacting with them in the playroom. And uh, just a side note, all of uh, our law enforcement civilian, obviously, and sworn, we're all, uh, you know, there's a very, we go through a very comprehensive background check, including a polygraph and a psych exam. Um, so um, all of us, you know, um, have been, you know, our background has been checked. So, you know, really anybody could watch that child and they're safe um, in that playroom. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, one of our forensic interview rooms, uh, which is uh, a forensic interview is a is a neutral fact finder uh, to find out, you know, to get input from the child without prompting them to say certain things. So allowing that child um, to to talk about what happened to them and asking a series of an open ended questions that would allow that child or that victim, it could be adult as well, to talk about um, what happened to them and to find out if there is a crime that was committed uh, against that child. Um, in those forensic interview rooms, we have also forensic monitoring rooms where the detective and the Department of Child Safety investigator, they're actually there to uh, listen to the live interview and ask maybe uh, follow-up questions uh, that they would ask the forensic interviewer to ask follow-up questions in terms of for their investigation to further the investigation. Uh, next. Um, so we have two medical exam rooms. This is the child, this is the Phoenix Children's Hospital. So it's the child medical exam rooms. Um, and so within that 120 hour window, uh, if they disclose, then they would actually have a medical exam. It's a basically head to toe check and uh, taking forensic photographs um, to, uh, and DNA, obviously swabs. And a lot of times we take away all their clothing. So we have a lot of clothes here to give to the to the victims and the families, uh, because a lot of times we have to take them as evidence. Uh, so on the adult side, uh, we see a lot of strangulation, uh, you know, domestic violence cases. Also, we see sexual assault uh, cases as well. Uh, we're working right now with Phoenix Children's Hospital to also upgrade this room and give them a new bed and give them a new camera. Um, and so these, um, so our uh, nurses would actually take all that and lock them. And then we have a, a, a place where we have refrigerators where they actually uh, put all the evidence and then it's going to be uh, picked up by the, by the agency where that assault happened. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is one of our um, uh, trauma therapy uh, rooms where you see, you see a lot of, um, toys uh, because they do uh, they do sand tray therapy uh, they do uh, EMDR th therapy uh, anybody who comes through our office um, because of a case uh, an open investigation um, have uh, the capability to um, to be referred into uh, our trauma therapy program and they go on a waiting on a wait list and they just kind of and we only have less than a, a one month wait which is great um, we for all of our services um, in-house, we do not charge anything to any of these clients. So our uh, trauma therapy is free of charge, is through the VOCA program. Uh, and we have highly trained therapists. We have two full-time therapists with the Avondale Police Department. And then we have a clinical supervisor that oversees the therapist and also provide therapy um, for, um, for the children and their families. We also uh, talk to adults and uh, provide psychoeducation and awareness training uh, for secondary trauma. Um, and then um, we do a lot of training with them. So they actually get, you know, they they have maybe anywhere from 40 to 60 hours that they that they have in training our therapists just to make sure that they're up to date with their uh, therapy and just kind of some of the things that they do with our uh, crime victims. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so this is our training room. Uh, we, we do a lot of training. We, we have our MDT meeting once a month. We have about 50 people from the community and our partners that show up. And we talk about cases in confidentiality. We talk about active cases. Um, we also provide in this room uh, prevention education classes for the public. It's all free of charge. We do um, uh, awareness you know, training and education. Um, we do it in person and we do it virtually. Um, we post it online through our website at swifact.org. Um, and since 2013, we have trained over 25,000 members of the public. So that includes schools, courts, uh, youth serving organizations, medical providers, therapists, counselors, and really anybody who uh, wants to find out a little bit more um, about kind of what we do and some like, you know, we, we do human trafficking 101, we do uh, internet safety classes, we have all different kinds of classes to meet the needs of the community. Uh, next slide. So why do we need advocacy centers? Um, if we go to the next slide is uh, because uh, we just have a lot of need in our community. We one in really one in 10 children are sexually abused before their 18th birthday. And that's really kind of uh, some of this, that the national stats. Um, we have just seen a surge. I, you know, I started over two years ago now, two years ago now, and we've seen just a surge in cases. Um, so we do have that need to serve the public and the community. Um, next slide. Uh, it's just kind of this is just national um, uh, statistics, which is uh, seven to 12 um, years of age is the highest rates of disclosures. Although our advocacy center is mostly seeing just in the last two years, mostly preteen and teenagers. Uh, we're not sure why that is, um, but that is just kind of some of our statistics here at our advocacy center. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, we have um, since, you know, it's 2000, this is kind of a little bit older because of COVID, we haven't actually gotten uh, better statistics and updated statistics, but um, 7,700 children served at advocacy centers um, in the state of Arizona, 64 of them were child sexual abuse, which actually aligns with the national statistics as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, so the rate of abuse obviously is way higher than the rate of disclosure. So, uh, you know, part of actually our prevention uh, program is to put it out in the community, to inform the community about abuse and about, uh, you know, just uh, cyber crimes and internet crimes against children and things like that to, to make people aware. So, and we go out in the schools and to provide the education and training. And a lot of times we do get disclosures after the fact. Um, so really that's kind of why uh, we exist and our prevention uh, program exists to just raise that awareness about just kind of what's happening and to talk to children uh, about internet safety. All right, um, let me see. Yes, uh, next one in terms of F offenders, um, nationally 90% of child sexual abuse victims know their offender. Here at the Advocacy Center is about 97% to just kind of based on our statistics uh, just in the last few years. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of it is boundary violation and it's grooming behavior that starts out slowly and then it just kind of manifests itself over time. And it's usually, uh, it's familial. It's either a family member, an uncle, a family, a close family friend. And so that's kind of some of the things that we see. We do see quite a lot of internet crimes against children cases, which are, uh, you know, termed child pornography, even though it's an incorrect term, but that's kind of what we see. So we see a lot of those our um, detectives uh, do work those cases as well. We're starting to see a lot more um, trafficking cases as well. We just applied for uh, the DEMA grant, the Department of Emergency and Military Affairs grant that uh, we were awarded uh, half a million dollars. We're still going through the approval process. It hasn't been approved quite yet by our, by our city council. Uh, but we are going to start doing, uh, hopefully, undercover operations, uh, proactive investigations is to recover uh, trafficking victims here in our jurisdictions as well. Um, uh, so, I mean, uh, next slide. Uh, this is, I mean, there is obviously a high need for prevention, education, and awareness. And so that's what we do as well. We have a, a fully dedicated staff member uh, that that is his job. That's what he does in the community as well. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, just uh, this is just kind of we do have. So our advocacy center, obviously, it's uh, the the funding is through the city governments, the four jurisdictions. But we also have a nonprofit board where we do a lot of um, we do a lot of um, uh, fundraising efforts. We partner with different organizations. One of our partners, which is put on the Cape has contributed over $50,000 in the last 50 years. And so the nonprofit board, which uh, council member uh, Tina Condi sits on, on our board, uh, so she could speak to that, uh, but we, um, we do really good work. So all the items that is needed for the families, that includes hotel rooms, transportation, car repair, uh, food, clothing, all that comes from our nonprofit board because we do a lot of fundraising. We have a 5K run uh, with Put on the Cape and Kids Fest with Avondale that is coming up in April of this year. We also have a wine and chocolate uh, fundraiser um, also in April of this year, April 27th, where we're going to try to raise funds so we could use that uh, money for emergency for families. So it really just depends on the needs of each family. Some families are okay. Um, you know, they have the means, uh, but some families don't. And a lot of our domestic violence cases or our cases that involve child sexual abuse where maybe uh, mom needs to take the children away from the environment, um, they need a fresh start. So, you know, we have to provide them with a lot of resources and sometimes they need clothing, they need food, they need transportation to medical appointments or uh, mental health appointments. And so that's really where our nonprofit board comes in to provide uh, the money and the services basically um, for those families. Uh, last slide. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was talking about uh, the nonprofit board, and uh, we have seven uh, board members, and we're always looking for new board members that would like to join um, to, you know, to uh, be able to provide uh, more funding for our crime victims and uh, be able to help them in any way that we can and provide them with the resources. Any questions? This is Council Member Condi. Um, Reem, thank you so much for the presentation. You did a fantastic job. Lots, lots of great information. Some information I didn't even know, so I definitely took notes down. And um, I just wanna just thank you for your passion in leading um, the Advocacy Center. You've done a phenomenal job since joining. <clears throat> and we talked a little bit about um, the growth that's happening in the West Valley. So unfortunately, there is a need for growth at our center to expand because of the rising number of cases. Um, one thing you did mention in your presentation um, that you're now seeing more preteen and teenage um, victims. Do you think that has to do with the social media exposure with like Snapchat, um, Instagram, all those platforms that these teenagers are on now? That is definitely a possibility. Uh, that is definitely probably a factor that plays into it. Uh, we also have a lot of prevention education geared as an age group as well. Like we go into high school, we go to different school district to talk about, you know, just raising awareness. Um, so that might be also a factor as well. I think it's, it's more than just one factor that, that influences it. Um, if we compare it to say like child help, which is in central Phoenix, they see more of that seven to 12 range, whereas we see a little bit more preteens to, uh, to um, late teens. Uh, now they don't have prevention uh, a training program in there, but we do. So maybe that actually might be a factor. Not a hundred percent sure, but it might be a factor. I think there is. It's more than just one factor, though, that influences that. Thank you. Um, we, we you know, in the past, and, and this is something we talked about with the county attorney's office, uh, maybe last year, we were seeing a lot of um, teenagers bored at home with COVID, um, actually self victimizing. They're actually, uh, you know, for a fee, they would actually provide nude images to who they think may be teenagers, but a lot of times they were adults. And so we were seeing those cases as well. And really the county attorney did not know what to do with them because they're self-victimizing. So they're a victim, they don't see themselves as a victim, but they're actually providing those images to whoever is willing to pay for it on Snapchat or other media platforms as well. So we were seeing that quite a bit, uh, really when I first started for the first year. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. 
but we're here to help. I mean, this is kind of why we're here is we're here to help. We're here to provide services and resources to families. Um, yeah. And uh, so, I mean, we get, you know, we're, we're seeing a rise in human trafficking cases. That's why I applied for this grant. We're hopefully going to establish a West Valley Human Trafficking Task Force with the four different law enforcement agencies and train all the four jurisdictions, all their first responders on identifying trafficking victims as well, because we're seeing it. it's coming, it's trickling in. But now we're going hopefully to conduct proactive investigations to recover trafficking victims in our communities. Great. Well, I look forward to updating everybody once we get that up and running. Yes, that would be wonderful. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, incredibly important presentation. Thank you. Uh, Reem, uh, thank you. you know, the, the trafficking conversation is elevating. Right, and uh, that's good news about bad news. Yes. And um, I think that everybody on this call um, is as dedicated as you um, and thank you know to, to fighting this. Um, and so I wanna thank you for sharing that information. And, and every time I talk about this or hear about this, I learn a little bit more. And um, I think United, we are going to continue to, to battle. And you know, as you know, we've got one of the biggest trafficking events coming up, which is the Super Bowl. And um, with things that are going on at the border um, and the Super Bowl here being, it's going to be a crescendo for this for this tragic uh, atrocity. So I, I'm just grateful that you're sharing this with the group. And Tina, for your service on that board, um, as you know, I serve on the board of Night of Hope, uh, which is not in our city board. And uh, so there are um, groups popping up all over the valley. And I think a localized uh, approach and then all of us uniting uh, together in Maricopa County is going to is going to create the change that we're looking for. So I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with that being said, um, you know it's a good segue uh, to, to 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 ask for future items. We can continue to talk about this housing, homelessness, but uh, we continue to, to uh, elevate the conversations about some of the pressing issues in our community. Uh, does anybody have any other uh, comments or 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 thoughts before we let uh, Ms. George go? Okay, we'll transition into item number seven, which is a request for future items. Um, any great ideas come come over, Kelly, or do you have any thoughts here? Um, sure, sure. We do have some speakers lined up for 2023 and organizations that have expressed interest to come before you all, and we'd be more than happy to provide that list via email. Further, we did want to ask, we know that we've gone back and forth with this committee on whether or not you would like hybrid meetings. In other words, we can do still provide a Zoom link, but we can also host at MAG for those who would like to come in person. And so we are interested to gauge interest on, on what you would like for 2023, if you would prefer to stay online or if you would prefer to, for us to go to hybrid. Well, uh, as a chair, and unfortunately, Vice Chair Duff's not here, but I'd like to confer with her. But you know, I think we need to get the band back together, everybody, at least uh, once a quarter uh, or, you know, a couple times a year if we can. I know that extenu extenuating circumstances, these meetings work out good. You've got the screen share, which actually is pretty convenient. But, um, you know, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a democracy here. So my vote would be to get back to hybrid and have an in-person meeting so we, we can all shake hands and, and see each other. But uh, what, what's the rest of the group think? Tina, what are your what are your thoughts? I do like the convenience of being able to jump online, just because, especially with you, Mark. I know you're busy because you go from one meeting to the next, right? We got to yeah. make it now. yeah. But you know, if we can do it where we can do meet quarterly in person, I think that's a great idea because that still keeps us engaged um, in person. Certainly, great point. Um, this is Allie. I I think it would be great to do it once a quarter. I also appreciate being able to go as today I have a meeting almost right after this one. And so some, sometimes it, it, it's just so much easier to be able to have a meeting and a meeting and a meeting and not be worrying about traffic and driving back and forth and all that kind of good stuff. But I think it's great to meet um, when we can at least once a quarter would be great because you just have to block out more time to make that happen. So um, uh, that would be my thought. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Council member Janet. I appreciate the option, but the truth is I usually have meetings before and after this meeting. So it makes it really difficult to have to meet in person. So I really appreciate the availability of Zoom. 
Well, I, I don't think we need to go through too many more folks and get the feedback unless somebody uh, is pressing to talk, but let's let's keep this at, at a hybrid, Kelly. And what we'll do is maybe a week ahead of time, we'll say, hey, who'd like to come in? And then, uh, you know, if, if we're seeing that it's just going to be me or just going to be Tina, then uh, we'll just move it to a hybrid or we'll just move it to online only and then save you guys the trouble of having to make coffee and all that <laughs> <laughs> That's just fine. We appreciate that, Chair and members yeah. of the committee. We'd be more than happy when we do our quorum check to ask to, for the next meeting if folks have planned to attend in person or online, and we can go from there. That okay, would be wait, perfect. now you're going to talk about having coffee. Okay, that could always make the difference. <laughs> we do, we do provide coffee. mag coffee, which is pretty infamous for being great. I, I'm not a huge fan, but there's lots of people are a huge fan of the mag coffee. And we could probably even swing for cookies, which you'd be surprised how many people come to our meetings for the snacks. Ah, a snack. There you go. You know the way to council members' hearts. Coffee, <laughs> yeah. free food, man. I get. Yes. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Well, hey, um, let's move to item number eight real quick. I know we're uh, running up against a little overtime, actually. Uh, do we have comments from the committee? Anybody want to add anything or any uh, information for the cause? Okay. All right. Great. Well, I can't share screens, but I can promise you, I've got my. Uh, uh, file up. We have the Night of Hope 5 that'll be um, opened by Mayor Corey Woods. There'll be police officers. Um, there will be NFL players. There'll be over 100 churches in attendance uh, at Gamage Auditorium on Friday, February 10th. Each council member that's on this call should receive a, uh, uh, an email, uh, at least to your staff, with an invite. You obviously will have a VIP ticket and attendance. But this is that crescendo that we're talking about. It's the Friday before the Super Bowl. And uh, we are going to do, um, uh, we're going to make a lot of noise. And we're going to share a lot of information about what to look for when it comes to human trafficking. Uh, we have some groups that are going out to the hotels right now that are sharing with staff uh, what to look for when they see human trafficking uh, and sex trafficking. So uh, we're going to put an end to this in our cities. Uh, and, and it's going to be over the Super Bowl weekend. We're going to let... Uh, those traffickers know that we're not going to allow this in our city. So Friday, February 10th, 2023, it starts at six o'clock. And uh, we just hope that you can be there. And I'll try to get to, um, um, the flyer out to Kelly so she can get it out to the team. Thank you. That's very cool, you guys. Real, real quick, Mark, I know you had mentioned last time that you guys were going to do a proclamation. And I was wondering if you were able to get that out to us because I don't recall seeing it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, we've got like seven cities have already issued. Let me get that over to you, Tina. I've okay. got, uh, I've got the email crafted. Uh, give me your, uh, let me, Kelly, I'm going to send it to you. You can send it out to everybody. I think surprise is next. Happy to. Sure, sir. Yeah, we do ours. We do ours on the 26th. I went to Mesa on Monday. Uh, Queen Creek is this week or next week. Um, it's just like Paradise Valley is coming up. Tempe, obviously. Um, so yeah. I'll yeah, I want to make sure that surprises on the list too. What's that? I want to make sure that surprises on the list too. I think you guys are tracking. I've got an email from somebody the other day, but okay. uh, I could get your uh, push behind it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Council Member. I'm grateful. And, and one last thing: there's this week, this Saturday, there's a Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Summit um, at Grand Canyon University. Okay. Um, is that on Facebook? Because I'll share it to our Night of Hope uh, page. It's, it is. It's. I think it's on GCU. I'll have to find it. I can get it over to everybody. Okay. Again, Council Member Condi, if you send it to me, I'd be more than happy to send it out to the, the committee at okay. large. Okay, I'll get that link out to you. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Good stuff. I'll take a motion for a German unless there's, a, I, I, I usually, I didn't even seal the, uh, the, the final comment. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Allie Klein, motion to adjourn. Tina Khan, second. All right, I've got a motion to adjourn in a second. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day and week. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Happy Thanks New Year. Time. All right, bye. Bye-bye.